All right, I see some uh, people are still filtering in a bit, but uh, I think we'll get started with the last two talks of uh, the session. And our next speaker is uh, one, of, uh, one of our own junior faculty, Wei Feng Xu. I think this is on, right? Um, thank you, Matt. And I want to start to, um, by uh, thanking Li Hui for organizing such a wonderful event for our 10th anniversary. And I'm extremely honored and somewhat very intimidated to stand here and present you my story that uh, we have been developing in the past a few, a couple of years um, with such an elite speaker panel. And um, especially I'm like a, in between me and the rock star and the beer. But I'll try my best. <laughs> So um, with uh, Li Hui's per, um, approval, I think I will start um, with showing you the biggest elephant in the room. Um, it is one of the most important day um, in the um, American uh, United States. And um, so this is uh, like uh, my original kind of title of my talk. And uh, so here I want to tell you that change is good. The ability of change, uh, being able to change is very good. So make your choice wisely between change or no change. And then by saying ability of change, we mean plasticity. And so, okay, the elephant is released. And uh, by the title, what I really mean is um, I, I'd like to use this quote from an ancient Greek, uh, Greek philosopher, nothing endures but change. Um, he basically said that one could not step twice into the same river for other waters are always uh, ever flowing onto you. I think it's a very nice analogy to describe the uh, brain as a neuronal a dynamic network that constantly receiving previous experience and reshaping its content and activity and then reflects by um, in influencing the detection and translation of the incoming signal. With this um, overarching description, the story I'm going to tell you about is a um, um, activity regulated expression of a neuronal gene called neuroguanine and how uh, we think that might uh, shape the neuronal properties and influence the uh, uh, plasticity and the network um, um, activity. As you may all know, neurons are the uh, um, fundamental unit in the neuronal network. Um, as a uh, unit for signal uh, production, uh, pr propagation. The uh, incoming, um, so this is uh, illustrated here is um, a uh, pyramidal cell. You can imagine it's in the uh, cortical um, layers or a hippocampal CA1 pyramidal cell that, um, that's dear to my heart. And then the uh, dendritic uh, tree of the pyramidal cell receiving um, axonal, um, glutamatergic synaptic input from the axon um, afferent and um, elicitate uh, excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And all these blips of um, postsynaptic potentials gets uh, propagated and um, um, passing through the dendritic tree and gets integrated and summited at the soma. And then this integration will eventually result a computational output of making an action potential output or not. So uh, this uh, direction of uh, signaling uh, propagation is um, uh, critical and fundamentally important for the signaling propagation, the uh, uh, fe uh, feed forward information processing in the brain uh, circuitry. And then that's the fundamental um, um, network activities that are um, underlying our um, experience and our memory. So changes in this uh, particular treat of the neurons um, can influence the network activity and eventually influence how we perceive the world and then uh, remember the um, outside world. And uh, needless to say, calcium is an essential um, secondary messenger for regulating neuronal functions. It is a translator of the uh, um, electrical signal in, um, into a uh, biochemical processes by calcium dependent enzymes. And I want, to, uh, I want to highlight to you that not only calcium is this chemical um, a translator between electrical signal, membrane signal towards the intracellular signaling cascade, it can also feed back on the membrane properties and influence the neuronal membrane property excitability directly. 
Perhaps the best illustrated calcium calmodulin mediated signaling cascade is the um, uh, NMDA receptor dependent bidirectional synaptic plasticity that has been studied by many labs, including um, um, a few labs here and uh, my previous postdoc lab. Um, illustrated here is a glutaminergic postsynaptic um, structure with uh, ionotrophic glutamine receptors, AMPA receptor, and NID receptor. AMPA receptor is the uh, principal feedforward uh, excitatory um, sodium channel, pa uh, sodium ion passing um, channels. An MDA receptor is a coincident direct, uh, detector. Um, upon membrane depolarization and glutamate release, it will um, um, allow calcium to um, flow into the cell and induce the subsequent events. And then um, the very simple-minded hypothesis goes a strong correlative um, um, stimula stimulation will induce a um, big calcium influx through an MD receptor, which will in turn activate um, binds to calmodulin and activate CAMK2 uh, chem cascade, eventually leads to the phosphorylation of AMPA receptor, insertion it into the synapse and potentiation of the synaptic response. Whereas a uh, mediocre or lower calcium influx through an MD receptor uh, leads to an activation of uh, phosphatase, eventually leads to um, dephosphorylation of AMPA receptor, an endocytosis of AMPA receptor, and the depression of synaptic response. And this NMDA receptor dependent bidirectional synaptic plasticity has been used as a model um, uh, shown here by Shaowu and um, Baer, um, converting the uh, uh, classical Hebian uh, type of plasticity using conditional stimuli uh, plotted uh, to the uh, synaptic changes of synaptic strength and using the uh, amount of calcium influx through NMDA receptors as the uh, uh, independent variable and, uh, and then the synaptic strength changes depending on the, cal the amount of calcium that flowing through an, of an MDA receptors. As I mentioned um, previously, calcium calmodulin can also directly affect membrane channel properties by um, influencing voltage-gated calcium channels, uh, some classes of calcium activated potassium channels um, by activation or inactivation directly of the channels or by uh, influencing the, the membrane trafficking of other type of potassium channels. So um, neuroguanine as a uh, small neuronal protein intersects the calcium calmodulin cas uh, cascade right at the uh, entry level of, of calcium. So um, I would um, just give you a kind of an encyclopedia introduction of this protein and why we are interested in it. Neuroguanin is a um, um, very highly expressed neuronal protein. It is special in um, several ways. So um, it, it highly, it's highly expressed in, hypo, as you can see, hippocampus, cortex, striatum, and also um, uh, some subcortical um, subcortical brain area, including amygdala. It's actually only expressed in projection neurons of these brain regions. It's not in interneurons. It's in the projection neuron uh, pyramidal cells in the cortex and hippocampus and medium spiny neurons in striatum. So it's primarily has a uh, postsynaptic localization. It, not, it does not mean that it's enriched in the postsynaptic density, but it means that it, it's expressing in the soma dendrite. It's presumably invaded the postsynaptic density, but it's not in the uh, in the axonal um, axonal compartment. There is a an, another family member of neurogranin related protein that specifically expressed in the axonal um, compartment. It's a fairly small protein. Uh, it's only 78 amino acids, um, but the the mRNA is um, um, longer than usual. That has a, a quite a bit of a 3 prime UTR and actually a very extensive 5 prime UTR that uh, it's implicative of uh, um, substantial regulation at multiple levels. Um, it's also special in terms of its biochemical properties that uh, unlike the effector proteins of calcium calmodulin, um, like CAMK2 or PP2B that binds to calmodulin in the calcium saturated stage, neuroguanin binds to calmodulin under low calcium condition. It likes apocalmodulin better than the calcium bound calmodulin. 
And the elevation of cal intracellular calcium will actually dissociate neurogranin from calmodulin, release calmodulin into the pool to be able to encounter calcium and um, induce the uh, subs uh, subsequent uh, signaling cascade. And it's also a PKC substrate. It was actually originally identified as a PKC substrate in the brain extract. And the PKC phosphorylation of neurogranin can also dissociate neurogranin from calmodulin. Um, there are multi a couple of um, studies on the knockout of neurogranin showing a uh, learning deficit in Morris Watermay's um, uh, task and also contextual fear conditioning task. And it, uh, at cellular level, they show, uh, sin, uh, neurophysiology level, they showed an alteration in plasticity and also alteration in the intracellular calcium dynamics. So, um, and uh, subsequently, the um, KMK2 phosphorylation profile. Um, what, interestingly, the uh, neurogranin levels in the heterozygous of the neurogranin knockout mouse and also the wild type litter mates has a very nice correlation of the levels of hippocampal neurogranin le uh, protein level versus the performance on the um, Morris Watermay's um, task. The higher the neurogranin levels, the uh, better the animals perf uh, perf uh, perform. Uh, strongly indi indicate that neurogranin is uh, somewhat of facilitator for the uh, performance. Um, and the expression of neurogranin is uh, highly regulated. There are multiple studies um, using a different uh, behavioral environmental hormonal uh, stimulation showed uh, up or down regulation of neurogranin. Um, I want to summarize, so these are the summarized literature on those, and uh, what I want to highlight is that all of these studies are done um, at a, in, within a long-term uh, manipulation, uh, either uh, hours or days after the behavioral hormonal stimulation, or a uh, lifespan of study of, um, for instance, aging or um, post-mortem studies from schizophrenia patients. Um, it caught us uh, our particular interest because of the recent studies in the uh, GWAS study from uh, schizophrenia population showing a uh, multiple SNPs in the uh, near or in the neurogranin gene is, uh, are highly associated with a um, increased risk of, of schizophrenia. In fact, this morning I just got an email from Ed uh, from uh, Stanley Center showing um, a very um, like up-to-date um, new GWAS um, figure showing a high, very um, kind of jump out of the uh, ordinary associ um, high association of a, a SNPs of um, very close to the neurogranin genes. So when we picked up this project, um, we wanted to look at the uh, regulation of neurogranin and how that might influence the neuronal properties and then um, um, consequently learning um, and memory. So the first thing we actually identified is a variability. We see a big variability while we are doing um, um, behavioral stimulations um, and trying to understand the levels of um, uh, neurogranin in the animal, how it's regulated. So, and um, we ended up doing a lot of controls and habituations to actually control the neurogranin, the basal neurogranin levels. And then finally, we settled down on a, um, a contextual uh, memory kind of uh, behavior paradigm that um, I'm using a lot of local expertise to actually uh, working on these um, um, uh, behavior paradigms that I'm not used to. So, uh, the first experiment I want to show you is that basically it's a very simple um, behavioral test. We put a, a, a mouse, um, a mature six to eight um, week old mouse, into a novel environment, meaning a plastic box with a very stripy wall uh, surrounding it, for eight minutes. And then we took the mouse out, um, let it go um, chill out in its home cage for another seven minutes and then I take, we take them out and then sack the animal. And, and then we uh, immediately dissect out the hippocampus and then uh, make um, cell lysate, uh, total, uh, total hippocampal lysate and then assay the uh, neurogranin levels in hippocampal, total um, hippocampal um, cell lysate. Here showing here is a western blood of uh, neurogranin and also the loading control tubulin. As you can see that uh, by the example uh, Western blot and also in the uh, cumulative, um, the, the bar graph, 
that by uh, simply um, exposure to uh, exposing the animal to a novel environment for eight minutes, we see a dramatic uh, increase of neurogranin levels in, hypo in total hippocampus by 50%. As I mentioned that um, handling man animal causes a variability. So we formed this very simple hypothesis that stress might be an inducer for the uh, expression of neurogranin. And then uh, without a further introduction, because uh, Richard has uh, pointed out, um, we used a uh, uh, older fox urine that will induce the inert uh, fear kind of behavior in uh, rodents. Just by exposing the um, animal to fox, uh, fox urine for 30 minutes, we also saw this dramatic upregulation of neurogranin in hippocampus. And we can recapitulate this fear-induced upregulation of neurogranin using epinephrine just by simple IP injection of epinephrine. Then uh, we saw a significant increase of neurogranin in the hippocampus. So um, I want to pause here just to um, kind of discuss with you why this, like, 30, this three bar graph is um, interesting and why should we study about it. So um, there are two very um, interesting features of this um, rapid upregulation of neurogranin. First of all, the time course of this upregulation is relatively short. So um, if we put the uh, expression of neurogranin in the context of the immediate early gene, where, uh, which uh, people normally study, uh, the MRA levels of um, IEGs normally shows a detectable increase of 30 to 60 minutes after stimulation. Um, and then uh, obviously protein, expression of the protein follows that uh, time frame. And so there are uh, exceptions, but it's very rare. And um, so other candidates for activity dependent translation, such as CAMK2, which is uh, really um, well documented, they, um, um, the earliest point in vivo, um, that this is the work from Mark Baer's lab. It's uh, 30 minutes after um, um, light exposure, after the dark rearing of the animal, and you saw a, um, a quantitative increase of um, CAMK2 level in the visual cortex. So 15 minutes is a relatively, it's um, quite short um, in terms of the uh, protein regulation of protein levels. And then the second point I want to um, point out is that um, we're looking at an uh, increase at total protein levels. And neurogranin is different from immediate, most of, uh, of immediate early gene in the, in the sense that uh, the basal level is pretty high. The concentration of neurogranin is comparable to calmodulin, cal which means it's uh, sitting around 60 to 100 micromole in the, uh, in the neurons at uh, postsynaptic compartment. And then the, which means like 50% increase of um, on top of that is another 30 to 50 micromole of neurogranin being synthesized in the neurons. And um, I want to remind you, we basically take the whole hippocampus and then smash it. So we actually don't know whether the increase is overall increase in all of the neurons or it's a significant increase in subpopulation of neurons. In any of these cases, this is a pretty remarkable uh, increase of the protein level. So um, then we wanted to study what's the effect of the um, um, upregulation of neurogranin given this um, observation. So, and then I want to show you some correlative um, work that I have done that we, we've yet to do the final perturbation study. So um, we took advantage of a, a contextual, fe contextual fear conditioning paradigm that first uh, developed by Fenslow's group and also being used by uh, Malinow group uh, in studying unpericeptor phosphorylation. So this is paradigm um, isolate the uh, protein synthesis dependent phase of context memory formation from the association of the fear, um, meaning the uh, shock in the chamber. So uh, the experiment goes, uh, because we are using IP uh, injection as a um, facilitator of protein synthesis, so um, we either do a saline or IP injection at time zero, and then 15 minutes later, we uh, expose the animal to the shocking chamber for two minutes or eight minutes. And then the animal goes back to the, their home cage and wait for another day for the memory to consolidate or not. And then we bring back the animal back to the chamber and give a, a electrical shock in the, uh, in the same chamber. 
um, the animals do not spend uh, more than half an more than 30 seconds in the chamber. So that short of exposure by itself will not um, allow memory formation. So if the memory is formed within this period of time, then that 30 minutes is um, enough to recapitulate that context and associate with fear. And if that memory is not being formed, then um, it falls apart. And we do the test, the, uh, the freezing test right after 30 minutes after the shock. So, and, um, and a fan source group have shown that if you infuse a protein synthesis inhibitor uh, prior this um, context exposure, then um, you cannot uh, form the associative memory, suggesting uh, the initial phase of the uh, context mem memory formation require protein synthesis. So um, we, this is a basically, we uh, repeated the results that our um, fan source group has done in red and also uh, um, myelinol group done in mouse, that simple uh, two minutes exposure in the context does not induce a um, um, fear memory um, association, whereas eight minutes, we're losing the, uh, um, eight minutes, um, um, Context exposure, it, exposure is enough to induce this uh, associ uh, association of fear memory. By uh, simply inject um, epi epinephrine into the animal, nothing happens. It's still a naive animal, does not recognize the context. But combination of the IP injection with a two minutes exposure in the context, um, mind you, the IP injection is 15, uh, 15 minutes earlier than the, uh, than the um, uh, context exposure, that's enough to um, form the association of the context memory with the fear. And we see a nice correlation in the uh, expression of neurogranny levels with the uh, manipulations that we're doing. So basically we're using the first day of manipulation with saline injection combined with context um, exposure. So here it's showing you that uh, simple two minutes context exposure, neurogranule level is rock solid. It's not like that if you poke the animal, it'll go wild with the neurogranule level. So you require a certain amount of neural activity to induce that. But IP injection alone, or IP injection combined with two minutes um, context exposure, or simply eight minutes um, context exposure, we can increase the uh, um, neurogranule levels in hippocampus uh, by 50%. And this is not a whole brain phenomenon, in, especially in the context memory uh, uh, task. Uh, we, if we just take the cor total cortical region, then the uh, neurogranny level stays um, 100%, uh, there is no change. And striatum, we see a slight upward shifting of the, um, of the um, um, neurogranny levels. Um, and we have other studies actually show a very strong stress test actually will induce neurogranin uh, upregulation in striatum. Um, this um, is a mild, well, milder stress, acute stress that has the uh, upward shifting, but it's not reaching significance. So um, as I said, that uh, at this point, these studies are relatively correlated. We see a nice correlation of the behavior uh, context of memory formation that uh, is correlated with uh, the uh, changes in neurogranin expression levels. We're developing molecular tools to uh, perturb the upregulation of neurogranin in hippocampus to see whether we will be able to intersect this type of uh, learning and test the hypothesis whether the upregulation of neurogranin under this circumstance is important for uh, the memory formation. So uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes of my time, I just want to, um, so, the obvious uh, follow-up question, one is uh, being, what mediates the upregulation of the neurogranin, uh, trans, uh, neurogranin levels? And then two, what, what impact it will have on the neuronal properties? So to do that, we uh, switch to a in vitro, two in vitro systems. The signaling cascade studies are done in dissociate cortical cultures. And I should mention that uh, the behavior work is a collaboration with our po of postdoc Kendrick Jones and uh, a technician Chris, um, somewhere in the audience, hopefully. Um, so um, basically, we um, plate the uh, very dense cortical culture, uh, neuron uh, in the dish. 
And then after three weeks of culture, we stimulate the uh, uh, neuron by inhibiting the inhibit, inhibit, inhibitory uh, system using bicuculin. And after the stimulation, we collect the cell lysate at different time point. And show, showing here that by 15 minutes after the bicuculin stimulation, we see a significant increase of the neurogranin levels from the total cell lysate. And um, the um, adrenergic system, if we recruit the adrenergic system in the culture system by co-applying bicuclean and norepinephrine, then so um, we shorten the time of the uh, um, time, time scale of the upregulation by 10 minutes after the co-application of bicuclean and norepinephrine we already see a very dramatic increase of neurogranin levels. That's comparable and even, even more than the bicuculin treatment by itself. So um, um, adrenergic system uh, facilitates this um, pathway of increased neurogranin. And we can also see this um, increase by um, immunohistochemistry. These are hippocampal neuron cultures stimulated um, with a uh, combination of neuroepinephrine and bicuculin. You see a dramatic increase of neurogranin showing in red in comparison of the, uh, I, can, I have two. <laughs> showing, in, showing in red is neurogranin and the green is PSE95. <laughs> To, show, to highlight the postsynaptic compartment, you can see the dendritic uh, arbor is being uh, quite highlighted, but I would not go beyond that uh, at this point before we do more experiment. So, um, and I'm just going to flash through because the, the, the slides look similar, and we're basically asking whether this upregulation is transcription dependent or translational dependent. So we're either using bicuculin single treatment or bicuculin neuroepinephrine co-treatment. And uh, in a minute, you will, know, you will see why. So um, here is to show that uh, with a transcriptional, uh, transcription uh, inhibitor, we still see this upregulation of, neuro, uh, of neurogranin. So it's, uh, it's, it's independent of transcription. But if we include the cyclohexamide to block translation, co-application with um, the stimulation of bicuclin or uh, bicuclin plus neuroepinephrine, we can completely wipe out this um, upregulation of neurogranin. So it's suggesting that uh, it requires the uh, translation of neurogranin. And um, so then the question becomes whether it's a uh, newly synthesized uh, neurogranin or it's the uh, decrease of uh, uh, blockade of degradation of existing neurogranin. So whether there's a, a constitutive um, equilibrium that we're, um, we're uh, perturbing. So to um, ask this question, we actually t um, tapped into Miriam's uh, expertise and looking at the polyribosomal com uh, bound uh, mRNA population. Um, the uh, hypothesis that if it's a newly, if it's increase of translation, then you would see more polyribosomal bound uh, neurogranin mRNA. So what we uh, can does it did is to use a sucrose cushion method to separate um, uh, total separate mRNAs that has no or very few polyribosome bind from the uh, uh, polyribosome enriched fraction, and then doing um, quantitative uh, RT-PCR to look at the uh, transcript level. So here it's showing you that uh, with two different primer sets, that neurogranin um, bound, uh, neurogranin uh, MRA is in, is, uh, has a higher proportion um, um, comparing to other control MRAs. So CAMK2 and ARC has this upward trend, but it's not reaching significant yet. Whereas in the total uh, homogenate, everything um, stays similar at uh, control level. I strongly suggest that um, we're um, it's actually a newly synthesis neurogranin. And um, so, and we also show here that the uh, the uh, neuronal activity recruit NMDA receptors. If we block an NMDA receptor, then we block the upregulation of neurogranin. And it does not uh, require L-type calcium channel, which is another postsynaptic uh, calcium source. Um, so um, downstream from NMD receptor, we show that it's ERK dependent. Using U0126, uh, we can block this upregulation. And here comes the kicker. That, um, so 
when I first presented this data, um, when we first got it, and obviously uh, translation, uh, activity-dependent translation, the guru will ask me, what about mTOR pathway? Um, is mTOR involved or not? And so then we did the experiment, um, actually upon Li Hui's suggestion. So we uh, pre-incubated the culture in rapamycin to block mTOR pathway. To our surprise, it does not affect the bicuculin induced upregulation of neuroguanine, whereas it completely wipes out um, the uh, co-application induced neuroguanine, suggesting that there are alternative pathways to actually uh, engage the translation of neuroguanine. Um, they, um, uh, engaging the adrenergic pathway will recruit mTOR pathway and um, elevate the translation of neuroguanine, whereas a single NMD receptor activation um, does not rely on mTOR pathway. So uh, this, is, this part is still murky. Um, there's this, a lot to be done to understand the, uh, what's between this and that. So, um, and then just like a, a very um, short summary of the signaling cascade, we think that um, neuronal activity um, activate an MD receptor that would recruit um, ERK signaling pathway that uh, induce the enhancement of translation of neuroguanin. And adrenergic um, activation will facilitate this pathway and recruit mTOR pathway to um, further enhance the translation of neuroguanin. And the next obvious question is that what does neuroguanin do with the upregulation of levels? So um, in the next of, uh, three, four slices, we used uh, a virus-mediated manipulation of neuroguanin using lentivirus to either overexpress or knock down the endogenous neuroguanin. And then um, this is a, uh, uh, most, all the recordings are done by the grad student Huang Yi. And then we inject the virus into a hippocampal slice culture from red hippocampus, and then record from the um, infected cell and also the uh, uninfected neighboring cell. So, um, and first path experiment, we uh, looked at the synaptic transmission. Shown here is the uninfected cell EPSP plotted against the infected cell EPSP. And when neuroguanine is overexpressed, we see an upregulation of synaptic response. Whereas if we knock down the endogenous neuroguanine, the uh, synaptic transmission, um, uh, postsynaptic response is decreased, suggesting that neuroguanine facilitates the synaptic, um, increase the synaptic response. More interestingly, when we overexpress neuroguanine, and then we just do simple current uh, clamp, uh, recording by injecting uh, depolarizing current to the cell and look at how easy these neurons will generate action potential, overexpression neuroguanine Given the same amount of current injection, you will fire elicit more uh, action potential. Whereas um, I'm gonna, these are just a hit block. Um, the the uh, the warmer it gets, the more action potential you have. You can see a shift of the into the warmer um, color with overexpression of neuroguanin. Whereas the um, uh, neuroguanin knockdown will have a uh, downward shift that uh, the color becomes colder. Neurons tends to fire, fire less. So this is our current working model that enhanced neuron activity will um, recruit an MDA receptor, which will recruit the ERK pathway and enhance neurogranin levels. So by um, enhancing neurogranin levels, it will presumably uh, enhance EPSP by uh, enhanced LTP and also modulate membrane uh, conductance and enhancing the neuronal excitability. So this will turn out to have two uh, significant impact that we are currently working on. One is to shift the uh, threshold for plasticity, that it will um, make uh, LTP easier with less calcium. That's one possibility. So that it will engage the network become um, more um, potentiatable. And also, the enhanced excitability will presumably increase the output of the network. So um, and we are still uh, doing experiments to test those hypotheses. And then last, I just want to um, acknowledge people have done all the work, can uh, pioneer uh, the, with all the biochemistry work and then the uh, polyribosome study. Huang Yi did all the recordings and Chris is running the behavior test um, in collaboration with Ken. And uh, this work has could have, have not been possible without the uh, building 46 support from uh, many labs. 
and then the generous support from Stanley Center and also uh, PCAR's um, in innovation fund and then also funding from NIMH. So. Uh, wonderful talk. Thank you very much. You know, um, I wonder maybe we can try, you know, one additional thing, you know, apply rapamycin to suppress the mTOR1. Mm -hmm. And, but, you know, some people, they might concern about the paradoxical AKT right. activation upstream. Yep. Yep. We can try using two agents, you know, mm -hmm. the rapamycin plus a heat shock protein, mm -hmm. you know, ligand. Mm -hmm. So to see how it changed the expression level of the neural granny. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think it's, uh, as I said, when I first tried those experiments, I, to be honest with, with you, I was not very um, familiar with the literature. When I digged in, I saw quite a bit of controversy. And uh, I was surprised to see this segregation. And we're actually puzzled by this piece of data, but I think it, uh, it strongly suggests that there are multiple um, regulatory mechanisms that's involved that mm -hmm. presumably antagonizing each other to actually spit out the specific outcome. And uh, Mark will, Mark asked several times that other activity, well, other stimulation that induce activity-dependent translation of proteins, would that actually induce neurogranin translation and then the the um, preliminary result is actually no. Hmm. So um, yeah. I think um, we all talk about activity-dependent translation, and here I just want to highlight that there might be more than one mechanism, there are multiple pathways, um, and then the, uh, the target pool might also be different as well, depending on the, uh, the behavioral stimulation, the neuromodulatory system that uh, is engaged, and then the outcome might be different. So, yeah. Yeah, the quick reason why I focus on the M2L1, mm -hmm. because in you know, M2L1, C1, is the master switch for the metabolite and nutrients. Yeah. And it had tremendous, you know, relevance, mm -hmm. you know, for the whole neuronal activity. Yes, yeah. Okay, well, I think I'll move on to the, the final talk. The rock star. So thanks for everything.